Now, the messages I'm going to share with you today, I've talked on, in this church quite a bit about the gospel, righteousness by faith, preparation for the second coming of Christ. The messages today are probably the most serious I have ever presented in this congregation. Uh, I invite your prayers and your uh, compassion because we're going to be looking at some things that are not easy to look at. But folks, we are in serious times. This is not business as usual time in our country, in our world, and in our church. And so I ask your, your careful attention. Let's start out with a Bible text. It's in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And we'll look at verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Well, some believe that this says that God has set the day when Jesus Christ will return. Could it be that they are right? That's what it says. He has appointed a day. And then I found something in Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 212. The Lord has a time appointed when he will bind off the work. Well, there it is. The time has been set. But we need to read on in that very same paragraph. If the power of Satan can come into the very temple of God and manipulate things as he pleases, the time of preparation will be prolonged. Has this happened? Yes, God did appoint a time when he planned for Jesus to return. That was between the year 1890 and 1900. That was the time appointed when the light that was to lighten the whole world with his glory was unfolding like a beautiful flower. And the loud rain and the loud cry were on the horizon immediately. God was ready to bind off the work. But the power of Satan did manipulate things in the very temple of God. And time has been prolonged 120 years beyond his plan. And so now the question is, is Satan still manipulating things in the temple of God today? That's the question that I'm going to address today. I discovered some very interesting things during the last um, couple of years. Um, Alex Bryant is the secretary of the North American Division, and he was asked the question, do our beliefs differ from evangelicals. Evangelicals are the Christian conservative churches, particularly in the United States. Do our beliefs differ from evangelicals? His answer, not much. Doctrinally, the two are about the same. And to have a leader of the church utter those words, I think means that Satan is still manipulating things in the very temple of God. Here's a short list, a short list of our differences with evangelical Christian teachings of today. Number one, their gospel is 100% different than the gospel of the Bible. Number two, they believe that the atonement was completed at the cross, finished at Jesus' death. Number three, they believe that the secret rapture will precede, will precede the Jews becoming the 144,000 that the book of Revelation talks about. Number four, they believe that Jesus will set up his kingdom on earth and rule right here for 1,000 years. Number five, they believe that our immortal soul goes to heaven immediately when we die. Number six, they believe that hellfire will roast sinners for all eternity because of their sins. And number seven, they believe that it's just fine to ignore one of God's Ten Commandments. That's just a short list. How can it be said that our doctrines differ very little from evangelical Christian teachings? When um, 
Dr. Ben Carson was running for President of the United States, a lot of people became curious about what Seventh-day Adventists were all about, who they were, what they believed. And we were a little reluctant to share our, our information about that, but some others were very ready to share information. There's a magazine with the odd name of Mother Jones. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But uh, that magazine highlighted the Seventh-day Adventist positions on various issues such as Sabbath and Sunday, uh, such as the time of trouble that's coming upon this world. Uh, even they talked about the impersonation of Christ by Satan that we believe in and the death decree that will be passed upon Sabbath keepers. They highlighted all those things. And I just say praise God that our message got out there even it took the very stones to cry out. It was, that's good. Um, found quite a few things about our understanding even of Roman Catholicism. When Ben Carson was running for president he said Anti-Catholic prejudice, as expressed by Ellen White, still can be found in Adventism, uh, unfortunately, he said. And he said he was really not sure about Adventists being persecuted. It was probably Christians being persecuted. And then there was Spectrum magazine. Ellen White copied from Uriah Smith about Catholic persecution at the end of time, and the Bible does not support this. And he, they actually said that for those who teach that Christ had the same kind of nature that we have, a fallen human nature, that's the real Antichrist. Um, Elder John Pauline, who is a scholar in the Adventist church, said that anti-Catholic beliefs, meaning that the Catholic church fulfills the prophecies of Revelation, is not representative of Adventism. The preaching of Revelation 13 is more likely to offend people than to help people. Uh, since conditional prophecy can change some prophecies in the Bible, we know about the Jonah thing, uh, the Catholic Church can still change and be accepted by God, and he said God is not done with the Catholic Church or the Pope. And so we have a number of things here that I think are still some uh, manipulations in the temple of God that are still causing serious problems and one, I wonder how this is all going to be turned around and how it is all going to be finished in God's plan. Is the time of preparation that we live in today being prolonged because Satan is still able to manipulate things in the very temple of God, the heart of God's work, the heart of God's plan? A couple of letters came into the Adventist Review that I thought were interesting. Uh, one said, glory to God for the release of the unpublished and published materials of Ellen White on the Ellen White website. Great, we have all the materials now that she has written that we can find and they're available for our study. Then the next letter said this, this remarkable Christian woman has shaped and influenced my views and remains one of my favorite Adventist authors. I may not be in full agreement with her, but she continues to play an important and significant role in the Seventh-day Adventist church in the world. And I say, wow, is Satan manipulating things still? With friends like that, do we need enemies? Don't, I like her, she's good, but I don't agree with her. Can't always agree with what she said. Um, Sabbath, the Sabbath is central to end time events. I found this question in, the, uh, in a column in the Adventist Review. My family recently entertained an out-of-town friend. We took her to a restaurant for Sabbath lunch and learned afterward that she felt uncomfortable about it. What do you think? And the first line said, I guess I would think of the gospel Sabbath stories where religious authorities tried to set rules for Jesus' behavior because they didn't appreciate that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And then it continued on, a column of principles like the Sabbath strengthening our relationship with God. And the last line said, I have two questions for you. What did you tell your friend and what would you tell her now? And I thought to myself, somehow we have been unable to give clear, simple Bible answers to questions like this. Instead, we give philosophical opinions and evaluations and leave the questioner with probably more questions than they started with. 
instead of giving some clear answers. Every once in a while, though, we need an encouraging story. And here is one. Let me share it with you. We're talking about the Sabbath. We're talking about a particular individual who uh, had a challenge, had a decision to make. Two friends warned me that trouble lay ahead in the weeks before I left my home in Zambia to study medicine in Russia. But in the second month, one of my classes began to meet on Sabbath. I went to the teacher, my heart thumping, to ask permission to skip it. The teacher refused. I skipped class anyway. The following Monday, the dean of students summoned me to his office and sternly handed me a letter of warning. This pattern continued for several months. Then the dean decided to change the letter of warning to a letter of expulsion. I begged the dean to allow me to um, study in Moscow. I also contacted a pastor and family friends in Zambia, a pastor friend of mine, and we prayed together. To my delight, the dean soon announced that I could transfer to Moscow. When I told Pastor Ziella the news, he replied, I'm happy for you, but this won't get any easier. Be strong. He was right. Things got worse. The first day of class at the Moscow State University of Medicine and Dentistry fell on Sabbath. I determined that I would not allow Sabbath classes to provide an excuse to break the Sabbath. It was difficult for me to explain to the dean why I chose not to attend classes on Sabbath. When I first mentioned the words, for religious reasons, he immediately stormed out of the office. The pastor of the Moscow International Adventist Church helped me write a letter to the dean explaining why I couldn't attend lessons on Sabbath and asking for permission to transfer to a class that met on another day. The following Monday, I presented the letter to the dean. He tossed it in my face. If you can't abide by our rules, then leave, he said angrily. My grades began to suffer. The professor who taught the Sabbath class wasn't cooperative, and I found it difficult to catch up with the missed lessons. One professor bluntly asked me, if your faith is genuine, why, would, why won't God let you miss church so you can attend classes now, and then you can attend church during summer vacation? Midway through the semester, the dean summoned me to his office, after reviewing the class records and notice, noticing my continuous absent from Sabbath classes, he gave me a stern warning. I renewed my efforts to make up the missed classes, but I was too far behind. Toward the end of the semester, the dean's secretary informed me that I might not be allowed to stay the next semester because of low grades and insubordination. I cried in her presence. She asked me to reconsider my faith. I began to plead my case before God. A week went by. Still no word came from the dean about whether I would be expelled. Three years have gone by since I began to pray about my Sabbath classes, and I'm still waiting to be summoned by the dean and told that I have to leave Russia. God has worked a miracle every day of my studies in Russia. One remarkable moment that might help explain why the dean has left me alone occurred near the end of that first semester in Moscow. The professor who taught the Sabbath classes was rebuking me for asking to be excused when the university president happened to walk by. The president stopped to ask what was wrong. The president turned to me and said, why won't you attend les lessons on Saturday? Because of my faith. I said cautiously, Are you a Seventh-day Adventist? The president asked. Yes, I am, I said, utterly dumbfounded. I love that church, even though I don't attend, the president said. I grew up loving and treasuring its truths and teachings. Amen. I sent up a silent prayer and said, That's wonderful. Could you sign this consent letter for me to skip classes? Sure, the president said, you must realize that when you are in a foreign land, you must abide by its rules. The Sabbath commandment, however, is a rule above human law. What a story. I'm always amazed as to where God places people when we are willing to stand for right and for truth that are able to help 
in a situation just like this. Well, God knew about that situation a long time before it ever happened, and he made sure there was going to be help there for that young lady. And, you know, just for personal health reasons, I found out the Sabbath might be just what the doctor ordered. A major study of 74,000 individuals was published showing a period of 16 years of follow-up during which women who attended regular church services had significant protection against death from all causes compared to those who never attended. Those who attended more than once per week had the highest benefit. Results were consistent across different race and ethnicity groups. The influence on cardiovascular and cancer deaths was especially remarkable. Religion maybe does affect our health as well as our connection with God. Do we really know our roots, our beginnings, what happened way back then? Now, every Adventist knows that uh, 1844 was a significant time in our history. Do you know the whole story? On October 15, 1844, one week before the great disappointment of Adventism, a boy was born into a pious German family. His name was Friedrich. Well, that was his first name. His last name was Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche. And the infant would age into one of modernity's most influential atheists, born one week before the great disappointment. The year 1844 was also important for Karl Marx, the founder of communism. Um, he wrote economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, in which he argued for a totally materialist society that moved through various economic stages until the workers of the world would unite, throw off the capitalist oppressors, and create a communist utopia on earth. 1844 was also an important year for a man named Charles Darwin, who in that year said to his wife, I have just finished my sketch of my species theory. He called it the essay of 1844, one of the earliest expressions of his evolutionary theory. So I don't think it was just coincidence that this year, 1844, was also the fulfillment of the 2300-year prophecy of Daniel and the beginning of a new movement. Seeds were planted that would burgeon into a worldwide movement that would take God's last message to the entire world before Jesus would come and would utterly destroy the philosophy of Marxism, Nietzscheism, and Darwinian theologies because that's what they were. Contrary to Marx, the Seventh-day Adventist movement proclaimed that the great controversy between Christ and Satan is the real issue, not uh, human uprisings and rebellions, and it would end not in a communist utopia, but in the supernatural establishment of a kingdom that would never fall again under Jesus. Um, contrary to Darwin, the Seventh-day Adventist movement taught that life originated not in natural choice, and arbitrary selections and mutations, but in the power of the Creator God who said, it is very good, and we are here because of that. Contrary to Nietzsche, the Seventh-day Adventist movement proclaims not only that God exists, but that his universal code of morality called the Ten Commandments will be the standard by which all people will be judged at the end of time. So friends, you think it's just coincidence that all these things happened in that year, 1844? I think it would be very naive to think so. Satan knew what the Bible predicted. Satan knew that this was going to be the beginning point of a final movement that would bring about the world's end under Satan's rule. Satan knew that. And he made sure that he brought three major influences to bear to destroy, if possible, this budding movement in its infancy. Well, he failed just like he failed when Jesus was born, and he will fail again. Now, as I said, there is much um, uncertainty, unfortunately, in our world about uh, 
who we are, why we're here, and there is even uncertainty in the remnant church. I think Satan has done an outstanding job of getting minds clouded about what 1844 is all about as the beginning of something called the final atonement. Hardly anyone talks about that, even in Adventism. The final atonement. Even our very best and brightest today seem to have a veil over their eyes on this subject. And I'm going to share just a little bit here. One of the best and brightest, in my opinion today, is our General Conference President, Elder Ted Wilson. I'm very thankful for him. Amen. But he wrote an article in the Adventist world called God's Mission, and I'm going to share a few sentences from that. God the Father would send his son on a mission to save lost souls. His mission was clear to seek and save the lost. Since the beginning, God's mission has remained the same. I read that and I said, now that's good. But that's only half our mission. The real mission of Jesus Christ when he came to this earth was not only to save some souls for eternity, but to reveal the character of God and prove that Satan was lying about God. That was his bottom line mission to vindicate his father's name. And I think the same mission was given through Moses and Daniel and John the Baptist and all the rest to tell the truth about God. And yes, save souls in the process. But the real point and the real issue is to vindicate God's name in face of the lies of Satan. He continued on in this article, God's mission in the New Testament was the same as in the old, to seek and save the lost. And the last line of the, of the article said, working together, let's accomplish our God-given mission. I wish, I wish there would have been something in this article about the seal of God, or the 144,000, or experiencing the final atonement. But that seemed to be not there. Even the best and the brightest are missing something. Doug Batchelor said something recently. He said, did you know that thousands are eternally perishing every single day, vainly believing in a cunning counterfeit gospel? Um, he continued, let, listen carefully. Let me ask you to consider these important questions. If we build 1,000 new churches, but the congregations don't understand the saving gospel, what eternal good have we accomplished? If we baptize 10,000 new members but don't disciple them to live godly lives, would those baptisms still save them? I think those are pretty bold statements from a major evangelist in the Seventh-day Adventist church. If we don't prepare these new members that we bring in so carefully and, and thoughtfully, if we don't prepare them to receive the seal of God in their foreheads, to become a part of the 144,000 and live in the sight of a holy God after the close of probation, what eternal good have we accomplished for them? What have we done? Have we accomplished our mission? We took the first steps, but that was all. Take a look at another Bible text with me. It's in first, sorry, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And it applies so much to our time. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and you know the verse very well. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. We even see that within our church, don't we? More and more people have ears itching for soothing stories, fables, the Bible calls it, a, di a diluted gospel which makes light of sin and ignores plain, thus saith the Lord. The devil is convincing the masses with his imitation gospel that people, and these are the words of Doug Batchelor, the devil is convincing the masses with his imitation gospel that people can still have Christianity without the cross of self-denial. They want heaven without holiness. He, Satan, wants them to have just enough religion to calm their conscience into thinking they are saved until they discover too late they are taking a powerless prescription. 
In fact, I think the simplest mission statement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to be prepared to be part of the last generation that will live under Satan's rule on this planet, whatever that takes. The last generation that will ever have to live where Satan is calling so many shots. Now this whole understanding has been called by some last generation theology. That's kind of a new name that has been applied recently. And you know what? Last generation theology has become the most hated theology in the Adventist church today. Believe it or not. Uh, a sermon was presented on, Jan on September 25, 2010 in one of the largest Seventh-day Adventist churches in the world. Its title was, And Yet Another Idea That Didn't Help Anyone Achieving Last Generation Perfection. The presentation, and I'm going to share what, uh, what uh, this was, the presentation is introduced with a five-minute video skit. A group of church members are sitting in a pew in a church just like we are here. As they converse with each other, they say to each other, we have to be perfect. One objects, so what about that whole saved by grace? Where does that come in? Oh, that's too easy, responds one of them. The group discusses a list of checkoff boxes they've been passing around, which when completed, they say one has achieved perfection. They discuss how hard one must work to be saved. God is with the Christian in his walk only way, way back at the beginning, right at the start. Then after a while, you just have to work really hard all by yourself. They decide to call themselves the perfection section. The one questioning all this declares, I'm not going to be perfect, and he leaves. And the skit is over. And a ripple of applause passes through the sanctuary as the segment concludes and the pastor stands up to preach. My friends... It is so easy to build straw men and then knock them down. Check boxes, check off boxes, whoever talks about that. Working hard all by yourself, that will get us absolutely nowhere at any time in history, especially now. No one says that. And then, as the pastor began his sermon, he proceeds to name M.L. Andreasen as the main voice popularizing the idea of Christian perfection way back in the 1930s. And by the way, sinless perfection is a phrase never used by Andreasen, but that's what was claimed. The claim was made that Andreasen minimized the significance of Jesus, saying his example was not sufficient for us today. According to the preacher, Andreasen's ideas were challenged and caused much debate, especially in the 1950s. The preacher then asks, does the Bible teach sinless perfection? The preacher tells us that sinless perfection means perfectly, in every detail, obeying God's requirements. He asks, being perfect, have you ever tried that? And then he shifts to the psychological argument. Seeking to attain sinless perfection will lead you either to despair or to pride. He claims to have met a student who was striving for sinless perfection in order to meet Jesus in peace, who had worked his way through a list until he had only one more sin to cross off. He had already conquered pride. Those who suggest that sinless perfection is attainable, he says, don't have a proper view of sin. They reduce sin and right doing to mere actions, check boxes. In contrast, he claims that Paul says sin is a power, a nature, a force within me that will not be overcome until I see Jesus face to face. I'm going to read that sentence over again. He says that sin is a power, a nature, a force within me that will not be overcome until I see Jesus face to face. My friends, if he's right, then Satan has won the great controversy because that has been his claim from the beginning that fallen human beings cannot obey this unkeepable law. We are too much sinners and it's impossible. Well, he returned again to another anecdotal argument about a young person who had given up perfection and who confessed that while involved in it, he had treated others unlovingly. And maybe, just maybe right here, since this man, M.L. Andreasen, is the one most often mentioned by those who are opposing last generation theology, maybe just a little bit about what he really taught. 
He uses the word in this special part of his book, The Sanctuary Service, which some of you may have in your libraries. In this chapter called The Final Generation, he uses the word perfection only once, only once. He builds his entire argument from scripture, referring to about 40 Bible verses. Only at the end of the document does he refer to one short Ellen White statement about the subject. He, makes, he refers to no statements by E.J. Wagoner. He refers to no statements by A.T. Jones. And he makes it clear, this is Andreasen now, he makes it clear from the first paragraph onward that he is addressing the significance of the role played by God's people in regard to the vindication of God and the conclusion of the great controversy, not to personal salvation. See, there's a difference. Personal salvation, that means right now today, you can have the assurance of salvation if your heart is surrendered to Jesus Christ and you're walking with him. Even if you're not fully mature, even if you haven't grown to the full degree to which you would otherwise. But vindication of God is a different issue. This is a different issue. The distinction has to be made between what is necessary for salvation and what is necessary to defeat Satan in the great controversy. And that's what Elder Andreasen was concerned about. Uh, he explicitly stated that a forgiven person who has not completed the sanctification process is in a saved condition. But until these saved people are able to fully defeat Satan's arguments, we wait for Jesus to come. Some claim that Andreas and limited sin to external acts, but listen to what he said. God's law is exceedingly broad. It takes cognizance of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It judges motives as well as acts, thoughts as well as words. That's way more than outward external obedience. The very first paragraph in this chapter says, the final demonstration of what the gospel can do in and for humanity is still in the future. The world is awaiting this demonstration. When it has been accomplished, the end will come. God will have fulfilled his plan. He will have shown himself true, and Satan the liar, his government, will stand vindicated. That's what the final generation is all about. That's what victory over sin is all about. He is not talking, and we are not talking, about personal salvation, as most detractors assume but about the vindication of the character of God, which can only be seen when God is a people who totally reflect Christ's image. I'm afraid this pastor that I've been referring to briefly here today, that presentation is a deeply flawed, painfully embarrassing propaganda piece, a very cheap hit piece. And I say, may the God of heaven have mercy on that extraordinarily misguided presenter and his clapping audience that day. In another case, a very prominent Adventist scholar sums up almost every controversy in the contemporary church in one sentence. He said, in the Bible and the writings of Ellen White, the cosmic vindication of God is the exclusive result of the sacrificial death of Christ. The vindication of God is the result only of the sacrificial death of Christ. That happens to be the evangelical belief of most Christian churches today. It was all finished at the cross. That nothing significant about the plan of atonement and redemption needs to be accomplished since 31 AD. That is not an Adventist position, that's an evangelical position today. And the same scholar, as many others, represents it as though Andreasen was the chief person who developed and propagated last generation theology teaching. The tactic of making Andreasen the originator and the popularizer of last generation theology is seen in again and again, but it is an admission that just a couple of generations back, our theology in the Adventist church was different than it is today. It is not the same today. This scholar places our salvation in a finished work of Christ on the cross. If that is true, if it was finished at the cross, why? Did God let 2,000 more years of sin and suffering and murder and rape pile up? Why didn't he finish if it was all accomplished when Jesus died? If God won the war, why isn't it over? 
Why are we still suffering under terrorist attacks today and school shootings and all of the things we know so well? This makes God responsible for the horrors that we're seeing around us in the last 2,000 years if he could have finished it as soon as Jesus died, including the Jewish Holocaust. Last generation theology is simply Christianity carried to completion. The finishing of God's work. The message given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church from the beginning. Andreasen did not need, nor do we need, E.J. Wagoner or A.T. Jones or even Ellen White, for that matter, to make this theology work. It is written into the very pages of Scripture. In the beginning, God, and in the end, God. That's what Scripture is all about. In between, there's a rebellion. When in God's name you and I have Christ formed within our hope of glory, then it will be demonstrated for all the universe to see that divinity and humanity combined does overcome sin. We will not be failing and failing and failing over and over. Christianity matters in the world in which we live. Only in this way can it be proved that Satan is lying when he says that fallen human beings, men and women, cannot obey God. It is just too impossible. To be part of this last generation, my friends, living so close to the end of Earth's history is the most incredible challenge that has ever been given to any generation that has ever lived on planet Earth. And it is bringing the, the corresponding greatest gift of God's grace and power that has ever been seen to the weakest Laodicean church in history. That's what God does in times of crisis. Uh, Ellen White said in Signs of the Times, November 27, 1879, those who live in the last days must pass through an experience similar to that of Jacob. Foes will be all around them, ready to condemn and destroy. Alarm and despair will seize them, for it appears to them, as to Jacob in his distress, that God himself has become an avenging enemy. It is the design of God to arouse the dormant energies of his people, to look out of and away from self to one who can bring help and salvation. Remember that night, Jacob really thought that his opponent was out to destroy him, to kill him. That's what he really thought. And the 144,000 will tend to fear that God has abandoned them. Where is he? The death decree is being passed. The plagues are being poured out. We're still here. Where is our God? Has he turned against us? In exactly the same way Jacob thought that God was his enemy that night. And I say it will take incredible faith on the part of each one of us, not works, faith, to look beyond the outward evidence that we see around us and trust in the God who looks like he has betrayed us and left us. God's people will pass through a horror of great darkness. They will have experienced pain beyond the physical, and they have cried out for God to hear them when he seemed deaf to their pleadings. And I say, what a privilege it is to live in this time of Earth's history. What a privilege, when we can see clearly how God's plan of redemption is actually working out step by step. You know that we have the privilege of knowing more about the great controversy, knowing more about how it started, how God is handling it, and how it will end up, than anyone in all of history, including Abraham, and Moses and Paul, they could only look forward to it. We can now look back and we can see how it's all coming together. We know more about the character of God. We know more about the challenges of Satan and how God will resolve these challenges than anyone in all of human history. And I simply say, may nothing distract us on this final leg of the race. Let us not stumble now. We're almost home, and something is yet to be determined by our lives that will hasten, not delay, the coming of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just ask for your mercy. 
I've been sleepy, we've all been sleepy. We have continued church as usual, business as usual. We have let the cares of this world tie our hands. We have allowed Satan to manipulate things in our very temple, the temple of our hearts, the temple of our church. And we ask now for your mercy and forgiveness. Take this people, this people who have been slow to understand, this people who have become so acculturized to society rather than transforming society. Take this Laodicean people and turn it into the wonder of all the universe and the final answer to Satan's lies. Thank you for hearing us. We're going to trust you. We're going to believe in you. We're going to count on you, even when we can't see your face clearly. We believe that you have the answer, and we want to be part of it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.